welcome. Welcome everybody to this week's uh, talk, which is co-sponsored by the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at UW-Madison and the Archaeology Brown Bag Lecture Series, again, here at UW-Madison, which is fantastic. We're so excited to be able to collaborate. Uh, I have very few announcements, just really one for next week's talk. So I'm going to pause for a minute and allow other people to give announcements that they have if they like. Okay, if there are no other announcements, let me tell you about our next week's talk for the Friday Forum Lecture Series for Southeast Asian Studies, and that is Post-Colonial Anxieties, Two Stories from the Town of Dollars, Philippines. So for Philippine Studies audiences, this is fantastic again, so please tune in. And this is by uh, Professor Dada Doko of anthropology at Purdue University. So we really look forward to having her. And she is a special guest of our Southeast Asian Studies Research Group, uh, CERG graduate student uh, organization. And they have asked us to invite her. So she is their specific guest and she's very excited about that. So don't miss next Friday, a Zoom meeting again. We'll send out the link, um, post it on our website at noon, noon 1.30. Okay, well, I'm now going to turn over the mic to uh, Caroline Schlinzog, who is a graduate student in the Department of Anthropology, who will introduce our speaker for today. And then we'll have a Q&A afterwards for about 20 to 25 minutes. So thank you, Caroline, take it away. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, so as you said, my name is Caroline Schlinzog and I am an archeology span graduate student here in the Anthropology Department. Today, we are very excited to introduce Dr. Stephen Acabado from the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Acabado earned his BA in Anthropology from the University of the Philippines in Diliman and his MA and Doctorate in Anthropology from the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Graduating in, 20, in, excuse me, in 2010, uh, he began working as an assistant professor for the University of Guam that same year. And in 2013, he joined the Department of Anthropology at the University of California in Los Angeles. Dr. Acabado's research focuses on Southeast Asian agricultural systems, and he's known for his major projects such as the Ifugao Archaeological Program in the mountainous region of the Philippines, while working with the Save the Ifugao Rice Terraces Conservation Program. He also conducts projects in the Bicol region of the lowland Philippines, as well as co-directing the Taiwan Indigenous Landscape and History Project. Dr. Acabado's research continues to engage archaeological issues that focus on colonialism, culture contact, and indigenous empowerment. Although the bulk of this research has emphasized the unique responses of the Ifu Gao, he has recently expanded his investigations of Iberian colonialism in Asia by theorizing how Filipinos responded and co-opted the colonial aims. His work contributes to a better understanding of the early modern period in Southeast Asia and is so important to continue. Dr. Acabado is a very valued scholar throughout Southeast Asia, having published numerous articles and continues to receive major grants for his works. We are very, very grateful to have him here with us today. And today he will be presenting Engaged Archaeology, Knowledge Co-Production in Ifugao, Philippines. So without further ado, please join me in giving Dr. Stephen Acabado a very, very warm welcome. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you, uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies and the Department of Anthropology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, I'm on a general election cycle for giving a talk at Madison. I was there in 2016 um, to share our work. Uh, so my, my, my presentation today is a continuation of that, that presentation a few years ago, and again, I'm very happy that the election turned out well. well. <laughs> um, but this this presentation today is a um, is is a chapter of a forthcoming book on on indigenous the archaeology of indigenous histories in the Philippines. Um, I'm I, I recorded myself earlier today uh, to to keep me focused on, on that presentation. There's not a lot of archeological data presented here, but um, the, 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 the narration, the, the presentation is about how indigenous, um, our, our stakeholders, our collaborators in, in Ifugao 
um, used indigenous epistemology to to interpret the archaeological record. So for most of us, it's it's very hard to to meet uh, uh, in the middle, um, um, especially with with the overly scientific um, uh, approach of, of archaeologists. But there is a space for us to to collaborate, and in this case, um, oral history, community histories, um, were able to to uh, provide a better picture of of Ifugao history and and in archaeology. So I'll, I'll just play um, this presentation. It's about fifty minutes, and and I hope the sound uh, will uh, turn out. Good. The long history of colonial experience in the Philippines has resulted in a historiography that seemed to have uh, neglected indigenous histories and indigenous experiences. So this presentation is about um, using archaeology and, and community engagement to produce and co-create and co-produce um, knowledge that, that has uh, indigenous in, input. So, so um, community engagement. Um, so the more than three centuries of Spanish colonialism in the Philippines was superseded by American benevolent assimilation. This shift is particularly important in the making of the Filipino identity, as it was not until after 1898 that the Philippine state, as we know it today, started to take shape. The term Filipino itself was not applied to the local inhabitants of Las Islas Filipinas. The term specifically referred to the Philippine-born Spanish, or the Insulares. It was not until the late 19th century that the wider inhabitants of the colony, including uh, the Indios, Chinese, the Mestizos, and the Creoles, co-opted the term and started to call themselves Filipino. When the Americans took over Cordillerans, including the Ifugao, and the Mindanao Moro groups, or the Mindanao Moros, groups who were not administered by the Spanish, did not consider themselves part of the Filipino identity. Hence, one of the goals of the U.S. imperialism in the Philippines is to mold the new possession to what they deem as a civilizing behavior. The crux of this effort is the idea of the white man's burden. Since the Cordillerans were considered the frontier, the new colonial administrators, through their experiences with the conquest of Native Americans, initiated a long-term mapping of Cordillera groups. Um, Paulet, who, who wrote about um, the American colonial administration and educational system in the Philippines, argues that the U.S. government learned from their abhorrent failures in the pacification of the Native American groups that resulted in the disappearance of Native American cultures in the Great Plains. This frontier perception encouraged an identity of resistance among Cordilleran groups. This is also partly because the Spanish failed attempts at conquest that ended when the Americans took over. However, this was a different case after 1898, as the U.S. strategy took advantage of their experiences in the Native American campaigns. Most of the early American colonial administrators assigned in the Cordillera participated in the Plains Pacification projects. They considered the highland benevolent assimilation and the endeavor as compensatory to their failures in the Great Plains. The push for documenting the upland groups became one of the impetus for the establishment of the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes in 1901, which became the Ethnological Survey for the Philippine Islands in 1903. This new agency paved the way for the search for anthropologists to lead the ethnographic documentation of the Cordillera groups, and later the establishment of the Department of, of Anthropology in the University of the Philippines. Henry Otley Beyer became the most influential of these pioneer anthropologists, as he is 
credited to have facilitated the emergence of a four-field anthropology in the country. The events that followed soon after the American took over replaced some of the Hispanic foundation of lowland cultures in the Philippines with those of Euro-American ideals. Where the Spanish failed, the Americans succeeded by using education as a tool to indoctrinate the diverse ethno-linguistic groups in the Philippines to identify as Filipino. To accomplish this, the United States had to, to develop a curriculum that not only teaching that not only teaches children reading, writing, and arithmetic, it had to refashion Filipino culture just as education sought to remake the Indians at home. The history curriculum used by elementary and high school programs in the Philippines exemplify this focus, where local history is ignored over nationalistic histories. It has been over a hundred years, but this foundation of Philippine education is still in use. While the lowland Hispanized groups adapted to the ways of their colonizers, the Fugao, as with other indigenous groups, continued their struggle by keeping their sacred stories called Pupua or Bukhad, chanted and recited respectively. These are only narrated in rituals that spoke that spoke of how the first ancestors came to Ifugao land, how the mountains were created, and how rice was first planted in terraced pond fields. These stories were used by the Ifugao descendant communities to make sense of the archaeological findings. So this work, this presentation, provides an example of how indigenous epistemologies inform archaeological interpretation. Um, this presentation is also an example, um, or it's based on the interpretations of the Kiangan community stakeholders that, that we work with through continuing discussions with Ifugao elders. We start with, or I start with, the Ifugao origin myth, which fits the archaeological findings in the old Kiangan village, um, which I, I presented in 2016, uh, uh, I think at the same venue. The data and their interpretation challenge dominant historical narratives in the Philippines. So um, the sacred stories in Ifugao and one of the main uh, very uh, important um, uh, sacred story is, is the origin myth um, that, that presumably uh, occurred in, at the old Kangan village. So the origin myth of the Ifugao states that um, it was told that the sky world god, Wigan of Kabunyan, brought down his daughter, Bugan, and son, Wigan, to settle in Kiang, an earthly valley by the banks of the great waters, Kadaklan. Along with the blessings of their father and the divinities of the eastern world, or Lagud, western world, Daya, and the underworld, Dalum, the two became the first parents, and from them came forth the people of Earth world, Pugao. Their descendants spread out to all corners of the Earth world. Village after village, they built and populated. The Earth became prosperous, and people lived in peace and flourished with the blessing of divine providence, for they for are they not descendants of the gods? People continued to multiply and several generations have passed when the evil in the hearts of men betrayed the divine will. Hatred and enmity ruled what was, one, what once, uh, what was once a people bound by the ties of blood and destiny. Greed and warfare, brother against brother. The smell of carnage and plunder stained the air, its foul stench reaching the hallways of Wigan and of the sky world. Wigan looked down on Pugao and what horror he saw. In his wrath, he brought forth a torrent that dried up the great rivers of the sky. The earth drowned in the fury of the gods. Wigan made sure that every being that breathed Every man, woman, and child perished in the great flood. 
all but two, a boy and a girl whom he swept up to the highest mountains, from them shall come generations that would inhabit the earth anew. Several generations after the great flood, people once again flourished in the valley of Canaan. They toiled the soil and hunted the forest for game. In one of their hunting trips, two brothers in pursuit of their quarry strayed in the realm of the people of the sky world. What brings you too far from your village in Kiangan? Asked one of the denizens of Gabunyan, or the sky world. The accidental trespassing somehow turned into a feast with the hunters sharing cooked meat to the sky world people and the latter sharing a very strange rice which the brothers found most appealing. Being raw eaters, the people of the sky world found a fire which the brother used to cook the meat and rice, a novelty worth a barter. But no amount of gold, jewelry, pigs, chickens, or sacred stories offered to the brothers would let them trade their knowledge of fire making. For all these things, they say, they already have in their village in Kiangan. Finally relenting, the sky world people offered their most precious rice, for they know it was what the brothers wanted in their hearts. Fire for rice it is, but be forewarned, noble children of the Pugao, that this rice of the sky world comes with much hard work. You shall offer sacrifices to the gods with every new shoot every new leaf from when you start toiling the earth on which you shall plant them until the ripening of the grains come harvest moon. And so it was. The brothers made haste down to their village in Kiaman, gathered their kin from both sides and started constructing the first paddy fields from their Sweden land in Imbidai. They offered the sacrifices as required by the, by the givers of the new rice and retold the story of how the white rice came to Kiangan. There is an older myth than the hunting of the rice, the nun aka, or changing of the crop. Kabigat, a young man from the sky world, married the mortal Bugan of Kiangan. They decided to live and raise their family in the village of Kiangan. Years passed and the couple's family started to grow. Kabigat asked permission from his wife to journey up the steps of, of Pangagawan Mountain, then down to his old village in the sky world. Our children are growing and so is the village. Our Abba, or Taro, or the Taro crop, does not last long and not enough to feed the growing multitude. I shall ask for my father and mother to share with us the grains of rice that they plant in the rice fields in Kabunyan, that we may plant them in our fields in Imbidai. The journey was made, the rice grains were given, and Kabigat made his way back to Kiangan. Bugan's skin from both sides gathered to harvest the taro from the pond fields for the last time. Then they sowed the grain from the sky world, and it was enough. These sacred myths mentioned above and a number of others hold clues to the world of the Ifugao. While no system of writing was developed, the oral literature of the Ifugao is the most expansive in the region. For example, the Hudhud in 2008, um, or the Hudhud is the Ifugao epics that uh, was inscribed on the, rep the representative list of the intangible heritage of humanity by UNESCO as a masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. However, another epic, the Alim, an exclusively ritual epic, is seeing its last breath with the abandonment of the Feast of Merit by the descendants of the Kadangyans, nobles of, of old Ifugao. These epic chants are seeing their twilight years as the last of their culture bearers have not taken on any apprentices as most young people attend universities. More than these celebrated epics, the sacred myths that are only recited during the performance of rituals have a life expectancy corresponding to the age of the remaining elderly Mumbaki, or Ifugao ritual specialist. Such an irony that the decline of these oral records commenced 
when they forgot started learning how to write through the formal educational system. But uh, based on this knowledge, we know that um, uh, the old Kiangan village that we excavated in the, uh, the focus of our excavation since 2012 uh, um, is a very important site um, in Ifugao mythology. Um, and so the, the line occurs in all origin myths and ritual incantations of the old Ifugao religion. Even living elders have only passed down stories from their grandparents. The old village where everything Ifugao originated the cradle of culture, the birthplace of the, of the Ifugao. Kiangan, most glorious of the villages of old warriors, craftsmen, and women, birthplace of the Kadangyan way of life. Ritual specialists revere the place as the most hallowed of all Ifugao grounds. Pinading, earthbound nature spirits haunt its sanctified grounds, ever ready to prey on those of weak and soul stuff or, or mana, uh, inanimate power. The village was the center of Ifugao resistance against the time, during the time of Spanish occupation of the lowlands, a launching pad for attacks on Spanish garrisons and lowland settlements. It was also a center for highland exchange as traders from near and far had to pass through the, this crossroads of the highland trade route. Kiangan, the old village, is gone, there's no more. The entire area has been converted into a rice field at least two generations ago. A few years after it was suddenly abandoned, no trace of its former self can be readily observed except for seemingly misplaced flat river stones that have been piled up in the corners or used as stepping stones on paddy fields or paddy lines. These same stones were formerly used to tile house yards and walkways of the old village. A closer inspection, however, will reveal a rich deposit of broken potteries, even on the surface level. During the archaeological excavations of the Fugao archaeological project, thousands of potsherds have been extracted from the different trenches, from the different trenches. A number of intact pots with, with infant remains have been uncovered. The practice of jar burials for infants is still a recent memory for elderly Ifugao, as the practice persisted until the Ifugao stopped making their own pottery about 50 years ago. More than the use of jars or funerary caskets, the practice of burying infants or stillborns under the, under the house is still observed in some areas in present-day Ifugao, sans the pot, of course. This custom is based from the old belief that burying the neonate under the house will somehow keep it a secret from the deceiver gods, the cause of such tragedy. No ceremonies are conducted, no animals are sacrificed, and mourning is not allowed for the death of the neonate or the juvenile. Funerary textiles that would normally shroud an infant or an, an Ifugao dead are dispensed with. Doing otherwise will encourage the deceiver gods to take more unborn children as they take pleasure in the suffering of the people. The only material thing that the child is done is done with is a string of arm, the arm beads, an amulet to keep any soul snatcher at bay as it journeys alone to the afterlife. Jars and beads, local and, and imported, play the role um, in the life ways of the Ifugao. Novels are bedecked in layers of gold and gold foil. Carnelian, agate, or glass beads in the performance of their Feast of Mary. They wear them during their funeral, though being the ultimate utilitarian, imported beads and like textiles were rarely buried with them. The soul stuff, or again, the inanimate power of the material object is bestowed on the departed through magical incantations during the burial rites. Same thing goes with the mandatory animal sacrifices where the meat is consumed by mortals and the soul stuff offered to the legion of ancestors and divinities in the Ifugao Panton. 
pottery was a local merchandise among the villagers of the old Kayaman. Um, a satellite village, Mungayang, is less than a kilometer away, produced the finest earthenware potteries in the district until the craft was rendered obsolete by the influx of lowland merchandise during the American period. These earthenware ceramics were used as cooking pots and water containers. Imported tradeware, stoneware, and porcelain obtained from lowland merchants were preferred as fermentation jars for the much prized baya or, or rice beer, an essential commodity and rituals in community feasts. Stonewares or stoneware ceramics have always been identified with the Ilocanos, a lowland Christian groups from from the northern region of the island of Luzon, who have been resettled by the Spanish through the reduction policy in what is now the provinces of Isabella and Nueva Vizcaya. The stoneware jars are much more common, though less valuable, compared to Chinese porcelains. Porcelain jars have been highly prized by the Fugao since time in Moria. It has acquired purchase and redemption value, so much so that it was used as a currency to pay off debts, purchase rice fields, and exchange for slaves prior to the, the, the arrival of the Americans. It is also an object of antiquity among the Ifugao as they have in, evolved specific terms for particular designs. For example, Ginayaman for dragon jars, Galgalit for the expensive white and blue Ming jars, Binulangon for Vietnamese brown jars with lion stud handles, and Dinulman for the more common smooth brown jars. Well, the Fugao generally associate this imported porcelain to the Chinese as they as do their beads. The origin is not as important as the story that, com that comes with it on how it was passed down from ancestors so and so until it reaches the present possessor. The longer the story of the ancestral provenance, the more expensive it is. These porcelain jars are kept within the family as much as possible and are bequeathed to newly married children as ancestors to rice fields or accessories to rice fields. So community memory and archaeology really had this very important role in, in how uh, colonized peoples um, imagine or, or define themselves and, and our work is an example uh, on, on uh, this, this contribution. But we also have local historians that provide um, a context to most of, of this collaboration. And, and one of them is Lourdes Dulawan, a local historian and anthropologist who was able to record in writing through interviews and interviewing renowned Mumbakis, the Ifugao ritual specialist during the 1980s. And she was able to uh, come up with a genealogical chart of the descendants of the old Kayangan village uh, to up to about uh, 20 generations. So more or less 20 generations make up the entire family tree, starting from the first mortal parents, Taduna and Inuke, they were the parents of the hunters, hunter brothers, Kabigat and Belitok, who traded fire with the rice of the people of the sky world and the builders of the first rice terraces in Inbidai, as recounted in the myth of the hunting of rice, or myth of the hunting of the rice. 20 generations are roughly equivalent to 400 years, more or less uh, contemporary to our, to the, uh, um, uh, uh, construction of the, the rice terraces as, as, as documented by our archaeological work. So it's about 1600s. Lourdes Dulawan's genealogical chart now hangs at the Kiangan branch of the National Museum of the Philippines. Findings of the Fugao Archaeological Project, or IAP, provide proof of community memory if one were to juxtapose community narratives with archaeological record. On the dating and antiquity of the terraces, they forgot have always known them to be as old as these were handed down from the ancestors from long time ago. 
They forgot to not count the years as a manner of reckoning time, but they do count generations with utmost precision. Genealogical reckoning is of prime importance among the Fugao as departed ancestors have to be individually named in every single ritual they perform even to this day. The Mumbaki, the ritual specialist of the old religion, have the ability to recite from memory up to 10 generations of the old families who descended from the old gang and village. This acquired skill of memorizing names of departed ancestors is still as significant to this day as it was in the old village hundreds of years ago. To this day, the old practice of distributing meat to relatives as a way of honoring one's kinship group in the occasion of death, marriage, or prestige rites survives. Taro before rice in the terraces is also what is recounted in the myth of the Nunaka. The myth precisely recounts the changing of the crops in the terraces from taro to rice to meet the rising need of a growing population and the terracing technology came way before it was planted with rice. The archaeological record of the Otiangan village proves that taro was cultivated before rice uh, was introduced. Demographic pressure as a requisite to rice cultivation is also obvious in the myth, as it is in the, in the sudden increase of material artifacts in the level where rice appeared in the archeolo archeological record of the old Gangan village. But uh, dominant narratives in Philippine uh, history describe the Fugao and other highland groups as, as original Filipinos. And, and community stories and, and the collaboration between uh, the community, the design communities and archaeologists uh, promise or promises to uh, uh, break these this dominant historical myths. And thus, the historical narratives of Cordillera assume that the highland peoples were isolated and untainted by European or even by uh, the hegemonic lowland culture. The highland peoples then became, become emblematic of stereotypes of original Filipinos, a label that once critically, that once critically examined is ethnocentric since it also denotes unchanging culture through centuries of existence. What the Fugao archaeological project now tells us is that the Fugao of the old Kangan village had active and intense contacts with lowland and other highland groups, especially during the Spanish colonial period. In fact, rapid social differentiation coincided with the arrival of the Spanish in the northern Luzon, or in northern Luzon. What we are seeing in Ifugao are parallel patterns to what we see in other Spanish colonies, especially in, in the Americas. We also observed that once the lowlands of the Philippines were fir firmly Hispanized, Filipino lowland traders became de facto colonizers of the highlands, a process called internal colonization. So the dichotomy between highland and lowland Philippines is also largely constructed in this historical footnote, suggest suggesting that the northern highland Philippines resisted Spanish domination. Even though Spanish cultural footprints in the province are scant, owing to the failure of the colonial power to establish a permanent presence in the region, there are major economic and political shifts in the highlands that coincided with the arrival of the Spanish in the Northern Philippines. The recent findings of the IAP reported in this uh, presentation and other previous uh, publications indicate that landscape modification, terrace wet price cultivation intensified between 1600 and 1800, suggesting increased demand for food, which could indicate population growth. This period also shows increased social differentiation and apparent elite form formation as a means of maintaining their position in the society. Although the Spanish colonial government never controlled the interior of the Philippine Cordillera, the economic and political transformations in the region 
were dramatic, and this was likely due to the Spanish presence in the lowlands. Excavations from the old Gangan village also imply that the settlement had continuous inter interaction with lowland groups and other highland groups between 1600s and 1800s, refuting the idea of isolation. Recovered imported glass beads and trade door ceramics from the site show the global connection of the region despite the idea of isolation. So the search for the original Filipinos is a product of colonial structures that have categorized peoples in terms of the flawed social evolutionary model. It also repeats peoples in infatuation with a deep, deep past. To address this bias, a focus on in indigenous histories would certainly contribute to a better appreciation and the decolonization of the past. And post-colonial scholarship uh, um, characterized by knowledge, co-production and empowerment uh, uh, would certainly help uh, decolonize the way we view and write about history. And while post-colonial studies is on the forefront of highlighting the inadequacies of deterministic models since their emergence in the late 20th century. Um, however, archaeology has been slow in engaging with the self-reflexive approach of post-colonial studies. And Liebman argues that the theory lag that typify the history of archaeological thought could be at fault. The heavy investment in scientific process and assumed neutrality of science are also at play in the slowness of archaeology to take part in critiquing the dominant canon. In the last two decades, however, archaeologists have realized that the discipline could not be meaningful if our practices do not include engagement with contemporary issues and historical injustices. Archaeology will remain an esoteric discipline if there is no commitment to address inequity in knowledge production. Awareness of the impacts of European colonialism on indigenous peoples, and if there is no active attempt to decolonize archaeology. This recent direction in archaeological research has guided the emergence of an archaeology that is cognizant of the colonial injustices against colonized peoples. Archaeologists have included engagement as part of their research design at the onset of a program rather than as a consequence of the findings of the investigations. This engagement ultimately results in the awareness that indigenous knowledge is important in our interpretations, that archaeology does not have a monopoly in knowledge production. And even if it is actively engaged with communities, or rather, even if archaeology and archaeologists are actively engaged with communities, it can still injure indigenous peoples if we do not change archaeological theory and practice at its source. It is thus important to be partners to the descendant communities, not just as mere contributors, but as co-developers and co-investigators of archaeological projects. In the case of the Fugao, they are able to make their own histories by facing dominant historical narratives, interrogating community stories, and critiquing archaeological science. This process allows them to correct erroneous history that depicts them as passive observers, as highlighted in previous uh, papers and previous uh, discussions. Um, no Ifugao learners about the importance of, of their, okay. no Ifugao learner, or for no Ifugao learns about the importance of the rice terraces in their culture through the formal educational system in the Philippines. What they do learn is the long history and as isolationist models that characterize them as incapable of change. With the community's engagement with the archaeologists and later taking control of the direction of heritage conservation, they are now able to develop their own empowering narrative. This narrative is based on the intersection of archaeology, history, ethnography, and community stories. What is more important is that they are using established institutions, um, basic and higher education, museums, 
to advance their heritage education and conservation goals. In this sense, the community has already moved beyond collaboration and has taken control of their heritage. And an example of this is the establishment of the community, the Fugao Community Heritage Museums that now serve as um, uh, the Indigenous Peoples Education Center in, in uh, the region that uh, Ma, uh, Marlon Martin, uh, the co-director of the Fugao Archaeological Project and um, the chief operating officer of the Save the Fugao Terraces movement is spearheaded uh, the establishment uh, in, in 2016. So um, the community, the Fugao Community Heritage Galleries are now recognized by the Department of Education as an Indigenous Peoples Education Center or IPED Center. The formation of the community galleries was born out of the need to engage Le Fugao in understanding and appreciating their endangered heritage and to provide a venue to empower their confidence in its value to the area, the country, and the world. We drew on our archaeological and ethnographic research to engage and empower local communities. The Fugao Community Galleries are hosted within the IPED Center building in Tiangan, Fugao. The galleries provide a center, venues with a showcase of material cultures gathered by the Fugao Archaeological Project over the last five years. And there are also um, other galleries, for example, the weaving room on the first floor not only showcases weaving equipment and implements, but also currently provides a venue for weavers to produce their craft and train others in traditional Ifugao weaving. The Ifugao weavers, the, the older Ifugao weavers, were, are the last to hold the knowledge of Ifugao weaving. So um, providing the space for internship and, and training the next generation of weavers to um, for for maintaining the knowledge is, is an important uh, component of, of the IPED Center. On the second floor, one can find archaeology and material culture exhibits and in another room, the textile exhibit. Well, it should be noted that the Her heritage galleries were established without professional assistance from trained or trained museologists. Rather, the collaboration between the archaeologists and community members facilitated how the materials and ideas were presented. This approach expresses how community stories are valued in exhibits. Such approach not only strengthens uh, local voices and coll collective stories, it also enables the sustainability of such establishments. On the other hand, um, the National Museum of the Philippines branch in Ifugao and other privately run museums in the region focus on different clientele and thus do not have the need for local engagement or robust stronger local engagement. The National Museum's charter to lead in the reconstruction and rebuilding of the nation's past guides its programs. It is understandable that the National Museum contextualizes educational programs, their exhibits and research in its national agenda. Private museums, on the other hand, cater mainly to tourists. We have not yet encountered a local Ifugao who have been to a private museum in the locality, unless they have a visitor that they accompany to these venues. It is in the sense that we see the value of community museums as areas for knowledge production and contestations to counter national narratives. They facilitate knowledge dissemination to challenge alternative accounts that are reified by national agencies. Community museums are integrated into the community's daily life, particularly when they facilitate community cohesion. In Ifugao, the IPED Center serves as a venue for rituals that bring together community members. This observation, um, echoes what has been said in other parts of Southeast Asia, that museums do not exist in isolation. We argue that the top-down focus of national museums and the profit agenda of private museums are counteracted by community-run museums, since local stakeholders need to feel a sense of ownership in a museum 
and be involved in its development for it to be sustainable in the long run. The UNESCO designation also has some serious ramifications in terms of representing the Ifugao as a static and unchanging people. Since UNESCO's focus is on conservation for tourism purposes, the cultural and historical context of sites have been largely ignored, or this, the tur tourism focus is probably an offshoot of, of the, of the uh, conservation uh, programs. This is illustrated in Ifugao through the emphasis and the long history perspective central in the nomination dossier. Conservation programs soon after the UNESCO designation were generally focused on infrastructure reinforcement. Um, for example, the concreting of, of irrigation channels, repair of terrace walls, um, and nothing on the intangibles aspect of the rice terraces. The cultural context is largely overlooked even when it is widely known that the production and consumption of rice is central to Ifugao culture. The colonial experience, national policies, and the UNESCO listing have contributed to, this, to disempowering the Ifugao and taking control of their heritage. Even though scholars have discredited dominant historical narratives that describe indigenous peoples as mere observers in history, these have not forced the changing of historical narratives in the Philippines. So what we need is a development of a, a curricular uh, model that, that incorporates indigenous knowledge and indigenous histories. And a strong IP education will only be possible with an Ifugao-centric curricula in elementary and high school education. This project aims to, or our project aims to unite Ifugao elders, and Ifugao leaders and elders, cultural workers and teachers to design the iPad curriculum to be implemented by public schools in the region. And we have done this um, in the past two years. We've been running workshops where, where um, teachers and, and community elders uh, collaborate with each other in developing um, learning modules and instructional, instructional materials that uh, teachers can, can use in, in their um, uh, history uh, lessons and, and, and local heritage uh, curricula. And the engagement with teachers has resulted in a first of its kind teaching module developed through a collaboration between an IAP alumni, uh, Charlene Lide Charmaine Ledesma, uh, uh, a, an MA graduate from the University of Hawaii and Jennifer Dunuan, a teacher at, at the Kiangan Central School. As part of Lidesma's MA thesis at UH Manoa, she solicited the help of Kiangan Central School to implement an approach that she calls archaeology in the classroom. Dunuan and Lidesma argue that the archaeology of education as a form of public archaeology bridges the gap between practitioners and consumers of archaeology. Infusing archaeology into basic education draws connections between people, places, and the archaeological record. This makes archaeology more relevant, especially to local communities, and in effect, encourage people to take responsibility and ownership of archaeological heritage of their place. And uh, uh, main product of our collaboration with teachers and, uh, and community elders is the development of the Old Gang and Village animated film or the Old Gang and Village story and animated film. This was funded by a grant from the National Geographic Society and the Whiting Foundation. Um, and the, the film was uh, developed by Mr. Armand Burgos, Armando Burgos, uh, uh, a friend of mine and, and Marlon Martin and I um, wrote the script and the story. So this, this product of the teacher workshops was the co-creation of the animated film, uh, which focuses on the Old Gan village, the site of the IAP's excavations from 2012 through 2016. The 15 minute video, and this is freely available in YouTube, um, it's a product of direct collaboration 
between archaeologists and the Fugao descendant communities. The video blends oral history with archaeological research to highlight Philippine indigenous history, uh, which is largely absent from Philippine historical narratives. And it documents how the Fugao resisted and accommodated Spanish colonial aims. Again, the Okan village, the site, plays a prominent role in Ifugao Tuwali mythology as the first village to be inhabited by the Ifugao and was the site of our archaeological research since 2012 uh, until 2016. So the integration of archaeology into local history and heritage studies empowers the Ifugao to counter flawed narratives develop, developed during the Spanish and American colonial periods. Revamping the educational curriculum is critical, but it is, also, it is also imperative that we develop teaching materials such as the film here. It is an easily shared medium that can, that can reach the Fugao diaspora quickly and efficiently and, and other uh, communities in Ifugao. By generating multiple modes of educational outreach, Archaeologists and community members are actively taking control of their education, their heritage, their history, and the ways in which their memory is maintained. The work of the IAP is perhaps one of the strongest case, case uh, examples in the Philippines for integrating archaeology into education, particularly because it addresses past false narratives that have been harmful to its people. And this was possible because of our community archaeology approach and and this was uh, a product of, of uh, the planning of the IAP where we had uh, community input at the very onset of, of the research program and although the younger dating of the terraces might be a shock to most Filipinos and Ifugao communities the involvement of Ifugao stakeholders in the IAP makes the dissemination of sensitive findings easier. The, I, the IAP promotes and encourages community participation in all aspects of the research program. Community archaeology entails a partnership between local people and trained archaeologists in the conduct of archaeological investigations. The community's participation aims to both humanize and end the exclusive control that colonial archaeology has, has had over the interpretation of the material past. In the IAP, local, local stakeholders' participation intends to serve as a catalyst for renewed community interest in their nearly forgotten past and to encourage them to play a more active role in the conservation of their heritage. The IAP's uh, initial ex objectives were primarily born out of the need to date the Ifugao rice terraces and to resolve divergent academic discourses on the antiquity of these uh, cultural monuments. However, preliminary consultations with community members brought out associated issues that demanded inclusion in the research if the research result, results were to be of any significance to the Ifugao. Even at the very onset, uh, the community was involved in the identification of the project's objectives. Since the project's implementation plans were conceptualized in collaboration with local government units, national conservation agencies, and the Save the Ifugao Terrorist Movement, um, our, our partner, um, which is a grassroots conservation NGO, uh, both legal and customary consent process, processes were obtained without any contentious opposition from the communities. Several consultations with descendant communities and current project site inhabitants were conducted to obtain the legal consent as mandated by the Free and Prior Informed Consent or FPIC guidelines of the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples or NCIP for research being done in Indigenous Peoples ancestral domains. Participation in the site excavations was uh, encouraged in order to involve local peoples in archaeological excavations. Site visits by local students and interested members of uh, 
the community um, uh, provided on-site lessons and local history and provoked a deeper understanding of their history and uh, their history and heritage. Public education and the processes of archaeology and participatory analysis of resulting discoveries served to involve the local community as active partners and not merely as objects of the research. Free access to the project site also considerably helps in dispelling the notion that archaeologists are sec secretly treasure hunters searching, searching for the famed Yamashita gold, among other tropes. Uh, Ifugawa, Ifugawa was the last stand of, of the Japanese during the Second World War, so myths about the Japanese treasure abound in the region. Um, so every uh, the end of the field season of the IAP, uh, we did do uh, public presentations of, of preliminary findings where descendant or different sectors of the community are invited to listen and critique initial discoveries and interpretations. Things usually get interesting when archaeologists present material evidence apparently lost in the cultural memory of the community. This triggers a surge of recollections that usually work both ways to validate the archaeologist's empirical assumptions and the community's fading reminiscence of the forgotten past of their heritage. For the contemporary Ifugao, <coughs> excuse me, who stands on the threshold of cultural loss, community archaeology serves as an aid to self-discovery and revitalized ethnic identity. Recent archaeological work has also encouraged the modern or the contemporary Ifugao to reconsider their place in Philippine history making. And thus, community archaeology and community engagement involvement um, is a, uh, an approach that will help the decolonization of history and the empowerment of, of indigenous groups. And a short history of the terraces in this case does not diminish their value in being recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Rather, it reinforces the awareness of the technological and cultural sophistication of the people who constructed the terraces. Again, the 2000 year old model and the long history model is replete with um, Western notions of, of, of of indigenous peoples said incapable of great feet. This sophistication allowed the Fugao to rapidly modify their landscape to fill valley after valley with terrestrial fields within 200 years. We should lay to rest the antiquity debates. They only exoticize highland peoples. Moreover, the differences that we see today between highland inhabitants and lowland populations are products of history and colonialism. It is more important for us that we acknowledge that we are in danger of losing these historical and cultural monuments and that we have a responsibility to take part in preserving our heritage. Most importantly, we have to acknowledge the value of community involvement in our scholarly research um, and conservation and development programs in the region. We emphasize the importance of community engagement especially since historical knowledge in the Philippines is still largely a colonial legacy. We propose that community involvement is vital in the dissemination of new knowledge. In a work, this is highlighted by community skepticism of the younger dating of the rice terraces, especially when all tourism brochures and history textbooks celebrate the old antiquity of the agricultural fields. We also explore the colonial legacies of knowledge construction and how this knowledge becomes ingrained into people's ideas of the past. In the case of the Philippines, archaeological models proposed at the, at the turn of the 20th century by American archaeologists and ethnologists have been difficult to demystify. In this work, we present the impact of archaeological work in the region, especially in Ifugao, which has contributed to a serious reconsideration of the dominant conceptions of history and history making in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Akabato. That was such, it's such an important topic and it was very well presented. So thank you very much for that lovely lecture. Um, now we're going to open up the Q&A section. 
So if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to type it into the chat and I will read them off and then we will address them. Or you can always turn on your camera, raise your hand and I will address you and you can ask the question yourself. Um, but we have about 20 minutes or so for that. So I will open up the floor to anyone who has any questions. We do have a question from Catherine Trotter, another archeology span graduate student in the program. She says, thank you for the wonderful talk. Are there any plans for the model you are developing for collaborating with indigenous Philippine populations? And will those be applied to other parts of the world where other indigenous populations have been marginalized and their voices ignored? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, um, the, the, my work in Taiwan uh, is, is geared towards involving um, um, indigenous Taiwanese, in this case, the Tayal, uh, not, so there are multiple indigenous groups in Taiwan, as you know, um, but because of, of their visits to, to our field site um, in Ifugao and in Bicol, um, um, they invited us to work with them, I know, but well, at least in this case, we have, we have an indigenous group in Taiwan inviting the archaeologists, and, and they've been hesitant to, to invite um, um, other researchers in, in their community because of the, especially the, the tension between the Han Chinese and, and, and indigenous groups. In the Philippines, um, we hope that uh, other archaeologists and, and, and other scholars would, would, would also open up the space. You know, it's very hard to, to, to uh, lose some of the control of research, but but in, in a successful community engagement work, and then if you want your community collab or the people that you work with to, to be involved in your research, you have to let go of, 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 of the control of the research. Um, and, and that's when communities will, will really um, start to invest in, in what you do. Otherwise, um, we're, we will just be practicing a helicopter approach where we jump in and then leave once we have everything that we need. And so it's, it's a way of, 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 of giving back um, and, and it takes a long time. Um, we also have to be ref, uh, flexible in, in our um, goals because uh, we need that, that space for, for communities to be involved. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, that's such an important topic. And I really loved how much you focused on the uh, community heritage gallery, galleries um, that you spoke on, providing a space for internships and continuing indigenous technologies like the weaving. I think that is so crucial and I would love to see more of it. So thank you so much for speaking on that. Um, if there are any other questions, please go ahead and type that on in. Looks like we have one from Christian. Is this recording going to be posted anywhere for us to be able to come back and rewatch parts of it? Um, I believe that I can speak on that and potentially uh, Mary. Uh, this is being recorded currently. Um, and I believe that the Center for Southeast Asia will be posting it later on. Um, uh, Mary, yeah, if you wanna correct. add anything. Yeah, that's correct. We'll post it um, to our website on the same page as the talk and that will probably take a couple of days over the weekend, but um, yeah. Email the Center for Southeast Asian Studies if you have questions about that, or you can email me, McCoy2, M-C-C-O-Y2, at wisc.edu. Perfect, thank you, Mary. Yes, Professor Kim. Hi, thanks. Uh, Dr. Akbaro, this was a wonderful talk. I really, really uh, enjoyed it. I especially appreciate how you stress the importance of recognizing both tangible and intangible forms of heritage and evidence. You know, as, as archaeologists, we tend to privilege the tangible for obvious reasons, but we know that this is only part of the larger puzzle. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to ask you about it has to do with, uh, as you point out, this this decolonization that's been happening in the last couple of decades uh, for professional archaeology um, and this reckoning that we have in terms of decolonizing practice, interpretation, and knowledge production. Um, with this reckoning, we know that there are multiple stakeholders and multiple viewpoints that have to be incorporated in knowledge production. Uh, and with a place like the Philippines, 
uh, that's so diverse. And you talked about this in the presentation, this, this idea of even internal colonization, right? When, when it related to the search for original Filipinos. Um, given that diversity in ethnic identities and in descendant communities, I'm curious how successfully inclusive these trends have been in archeological decolonization. You spoke a little bit about some of the present day tensions within the country, how certain indigenous voices uh, may be dominant and may be emphasized at, at the expense of other views. What do you see moving forward? And, and the other, I guess, related question is how has that impacted your ongoing work and, and those of other researchers who are coming in from the outside? Yes, uh, thank you. Professor Kim, no, uh, it's actually, you know, community engagement is, it's not for everyone, I guess. Uh, and, and if you do uh, uh, in practice and engage archeology, span um, you can't be apolitical. So working with community itself is, is, is you know, you have to, to be aware of, of the internal political dynamics. Uh, uh, you can't uh, please everyone, and in this case, you have in Ifugao, it's it's a it's a ranked society, and and uh, some voices are louder than than others, um, and and it it is also a, a manifestation of of, of you know, the, the larger Philippine society, as as you mentioned, um, and so it takes a while to to be able to recognize that power dynamics um but as as outsiders you know i'm, I'm, I'm filipino but i'm not ifugao and i'm a lawlander I, I i i am part of that uh christianized uh group or hispanized group um and so when i when, when i come in um uh, i have to look at that that power dynamics and and i have to choose um in in most cases who to work with um and so in this case uh, i have to take a stand on, on who would be someone um or a group that would be willing to to work with us um and you have multiple levels of, of this power dynamics you also have to work with the local government units uh, the provincial government uh the, the local elite um, and so on, um, but but moving forward in in this case in a larger uh, and a broader society or, or broader Philippine research, um, we need really to to be always aware. It, our our research design should always should start with should have a a a, uh, a an engagement component. Um, maybe 10%. There should always be someone from the local community um, as part of, of, your, of your research uh, uh, planning and, and implementation. Did I answer your question? Wonderful, and thank you for that question, Dr. Kim. We've, we do still have a few minutes, so if anyone else would like to type in a question or turn on their camera, we have the time to do so. We do have a lot of participants who are thanking you for your talk, inspiring initiatives. Um, it was a wonderful talk, truly amazing. Um, so lots of people really did enjoy it. And I'll have to look up that YouTube video that you had mentioned during your talk, just to learn mm -hmm. a little bit more, definitely. So, um, so I would have to say though that this isn't just me. Uh, this is this 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 whole chapter um, was written in collaboration with um, uh, the, the community, and without Marlon Martin, the, my my collaborator, the co-director of the Ifugao Archaeological Project, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to to do this thing uh, again. He was the one who who who's, who who realized the importance of archaeology in in their um, in, in 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 their conservation efforts.
So let me, here's the, the link for that YouTube video in case you are interested. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is great. So if anyone who is still watching, if you want to copy that over, save it for later. I'm not entirely sure if the comment section is also recorded. Mary, I'm not sure if you could answer that for me. Um, I know that it's recording the questions as we ask them as I read them off. Um, but I'm not sure if the comments will be there. So if you want to watch it later, I highly recommend that you copy it over now, just in case. Yeah, um, we have been including the comments. So uh, as much as they show up and we can hear. So yeah, if you made a comment and you don't want your um, comment to be uploaded in a recording, please let us know. But that is the usual procedure. So part of this talk also and appeared on uh, a Sapiens essay uh, that came out uh, that, that just published uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and this was co-written with Marlon Martin, my collaborator. And this, this, this other, so the Sapiens article talks about how archaeology um, contributed to the, um, the emergence of, 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 or the revitalization of the weaving technology in Ikugao. When, when we started working in the region, there were only about maybe 10, 15 uh, weavers, all in their 70s. Um, and so the, the iPad Center opened that, that venue for younger um, Ifugao to, to learn the craft. And now after five years, four years, we have about 45 um, trainees and so they're producing their own um their, their weaves wow that is awesome it's very very cool thank you again for sharing that article as well that is fantastic all right so i'll give it another minute or two for people to type in or ask any last minute questions um, yeah sorry dr kim go ahead thank you um, I, I have another question. You, you, you talked about this in the lecture a bit, and I was curious if you might talk about it a bit more. Um, when it comes to some of these, these various stakeholders and their ideas about knowledge production, do you see a, a, a sense that they prioritize certain aspects over others? In other words, is it more important to participate in actual field work? Is it more important to uh, participate in maybe the conservation aspects, how the knowledge is disseminated, how it gets presented in museums, um, artifacts, how artifacts are curated? Are there, do you get a sense for prioritization or is it just kind of across the board? Thank you. Um, so this is actually, that's a great question. And, and initially they, they, they just wanted us to do our work and then just provide them with 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 our with our report and later um they they realized that our, their involvement will actually strengthen their heritage conservation efforts so the establishment of of the heritage galleries again i think that that's the that's that that illustrates um the, their priorities and so it's providing that that the venue where kids can learn about their, their local history and teachers can learn about um, Ifugao um, heritage and history that's absent from textbooks. So, so, so again, that, that's heritage conservation. Um, when we started our, our, our archeological project, they did um, uh, try to, to participate in the excavations, but when they, realized that it's a painstaking, <laughs> laborious uh, process. After two hours, they say, oh, we give up. Um, so <laughs> community archaeology is not about having them uh, participate in the excavations. Community archaeology entails uh, having them as part of the research project, even helping out with carrying the artifacts out from the field back to the the, the, the headquarters is, is a big um, component of community archaeology because especially in, in the region where um, you have hundreds of, 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 of treasure hunters. <laughs> and so uh, having them see what you're doing, what you're taking out from the field 
will 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 change the misconception that that archaeology is about looking for for gold. Um, they they lose their mind when when they see us excited when we find charcoal <laughs> in context. <laughs> it's like, what? And so yeah, so um, so more on 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 heritage conservation, um, and in this case, it's 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 also transforming into something important about heritage conservation, and that's uh, uh, sustaining it through uh, entrepreneurial uh, aspects. So that that's why I think uh, weaving is very important. It's not only uh, uh, maintaining and that, that tradition and, and the technology, but also providing them with, with income. Um, so they sell the, of course, the, there's a thin line that separates uh, conservation and spectacle, but, but if you are able to bring that, that sustainability component, um, you're able to maintain the technology and it, again, at the same time, uh, they earn from it. Lovely. All right. Well, we've got just a couple more minutes if anyone wants to. Now is the time. But overall, it was just a, a fabulous lecture on archaeological decolonialization and indigenous cultural empowerment. So thank you again so, so much for this lovely lecture. I really, really appreciated it today. Thank you. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, then we will close this out today. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Acabado. This was so, so lovely. We really, really appreciate having you here. Thank you for joining us. Um, it was truly, truly a very lovely thing to have.